Kingwood United Methodist Church. I'm Chris Harrison, one of the pastors here at Kingwood United Methodist Church. It's such a blessing to be able to be in worship with you and lift up some of the upcoming activities that we have here that we want you to know about. First, this afternoon at two o'clock, uh, we'll be having a special All Saints Day service in which we'll be remembering our loved ones who have uh, passed away in these previous 12 months. We know that many of our families had not, have not had the opportunity to truly celebrate their lives in ways that funerals and memorial services often offer. We hope today will be a part of that comforting word in your life. Then this evening at 6 p.m., we'll be doing another drive-in communion service uh, where we'll gather and we'll receive the elements in our cars. We'll be doing that in the parking lot uh, over in front of Society of St. Stephen's, right across from the sanctuary. So one last announcement. Uh, it's time for our sixth to 12th grade youth to be thinking about the fall retreat that's coming up November 13th through the 15th. Registration is $60, and they can go on and register anytime at this point. This year's theme is Holy Rebellion, where our youth are going to be learning about what it means to live a countercultural way of life, standing up against the destructive patterns of this world. I know that they'll come out stronger Christians in worship and in learning, and they'll be able to add to what the church is trying to do here and in the world around us. Hopefully you'll join us for some of these events and continue to make us stronger through your participation. For more information, you can join us on the web at kingwoodumc.org.
Thank you, Sheila. Good morning, church. It's great to see those of you uh, who are in the sanctuary here and the many who join us at home and from the midweek broadcast and rebroadcast. It's a gift of technology that allows us to remind ourselves in word, liturgy, and song of the distinctive nature of the church. We are on All Saints Sunday, and for the past over six centuries, the church has stood over and against the culture of the world, which really celebrates the Halloween aspect, the All Hallows' Eve, uh, Druid festivals, and the church sets apart a day to remember the saints of the church, those upon whose metaphorical and spiritual shoulders, shoulders we now stand as the church today. So as we gather today, we remember the familiar words of Scripture as we find some degree of familiarity in our worship together when the psalmist says, I lift my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, the one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. We know something about that in Texas. And the Lord, the Lord will not let the sun smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you in your going out and your coming in from this day forth and forevermore. We gather, friends, to celebrate the goodness of God's grace, the durability of the faith, and the reality that God is always with us. In that spirit, let us stand as we join in our opening hymn of faith, remembering the faithfulness of those who have gone ahead of us. As we assemble and gather and worship this day, we bring all of our joys and our fears, and the saints remind us that they are with us no matter what. And so this day, let us join in this litany of hope. You are our God, and we are your people, and we are grateful that you have claimed us as your own. You have set us in the company of saints past and present. Saints who have made bold witness to your goodness and your truth. 
O oh God, you know the places in our hearts where we are afraid. We are afraid of a future we cannot control. We are afraid of losing independence. We are afraid for the well-being of our children. We are afraid that if the other team wins, it will ruin our future. Forgive our fear. Help us see that you open up new futures when we see fear as the way forward. Write the stories of your people deep into our hearts so that we may learn to trust you beyond our fears. Give us hearts, minds, and spirits ready to trust and follow wherever your spirit leads us. We are confident that you will not lead us beyond your loving embrace. Continue to remind us that we are called to be the church, to celebrate your presence, and to love and serve others. Let us place our hope in your Son, Christ the King, whose outstretched arms welcome us and holds us securely in your grace. Amen. As we enter into a time of prayer this morning, I have a few prayer concerns that I'd like for you to keep in your hearts and minds today and then as we go forward this week. For Joe Carbonaro recovering from shoulder surgery and all those who are currently recovering from illnesses and surgeries. Lori Duty is also back in the hospital. And then sympathy to the Baki family on the death of Nicole. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God of new mornings and new life, we give you thanks for this day. We are thankful for the breath in our bodies and the ability to gather and worship you in a variety of ways today. We come here to freely worship, but know this freedom is not available to everyone. We lift up places in this world where people risk their lives to worship you. Provide them encouragement and safety in their worship. Our hope is in what we cannot see, but what we can see before us is division throughout our country. Regardless of the choice we make in the election, O oh God, may we find our way back to focusing us on what unites us. And we pray that what unites us is pleasing to you and a reflection of your word. Holy Spirit, continue to transform our hearts and minds so that we may join you in your good work as we are saved by hope and made free by grace. May we be those known for our generous love of God and one another. Let us rejoice in the good while we lament over the sin and brokenness of the world. We remember those saints who go before us. We give thanks for all those who worshiped you, loved you, and sacrificed for you. May we learn to follow their example of love and grace. Sometimes it is difficult to find the words to pray the prayers of our hearts. And at these times, we are thankful that the Spirit intercedes for us, sighing the deep petitions of our soul. And our hope is in you alone, Lord. As you have offered us peace, you have also given us joy. We claim the promise that even in the darkest of times, 
No one can steal our joy. We offer these prayers to you, trusting you will hear them and join our voices together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Karen Forbes, and I'm here to share with you about Freedom Place. Freedom Place is a Christ-centered care and recovery center for teenage girls rescued from sex trafficking. A recent study estimated that there are approximately 79,000 children sex trafficked in Texas. 79,000. That number is staggering and heartbreaking. The rescue and restoration from the trauma these children have experienced is crucial. Freedom Place is the first long-term comprehensive care facility of its kind in Texas and one of only five such facilities in the United States. And it's almost right in our very own backyard. Freedom Place was introduced to KUMC through an OASIS connection with Arrow Child and Family Ministries and through our involvement with the Freedom Church Alliance Go Box training program last fall. The work Freedom Place does touched our hearts and after prayer and consideration, we dove right into ways we could walk alongside the girls and the staff. Since the beginning of the year, we have had opportunities to love on the staff by dropping off baked goods and Easter gifts, delivering and serving dinners to help out their kitchen staff, constructing a new deck on their campus, and assembling new furniture for the girls' bedrooms. We have even brought the Fueled by Faith workout program, started by one of our very own KUMC Young Moms, to the campus as a weekly PE class for the girls. Most recently, Freedom Place was the ministry spotlight for Trunk or Treat. As our children's ministry promoted donations to of toiletries and cozy socks for the girls, the response was incredible. Your donations speak volumes to the care of others this congregation consistently shows. These donations matter, and we are so grateful. Your thoughtfulness and love are sure to put a smile on a lot of pretty faces. I love that when KUMC does missions, we do it on a very relational level. Our interaction with Freedom Place has become much more than just donations. It is getting to know the girls and staff and seeing the difference we are making. One place we have really experienced this is by getting Freedom Place involved with the Feed My Lambs program. The conversations and laughter that flow as we're working alongside each other shows the girls that there are people with open ears and open hearts, willing and wanting to hear about what interests them, their dreams, to know them. Delivering the lunches, meeting the residents, and wishing them a good day reminds the girls that they are worthy and capable of being the hands and feet of Christ, that they have beautiful gifts to share, and that it feels good to help others as we are called to do. We ask that you would lift up Freedom Place, their staff, and the girls that they serve in your prayers, and we would love for you to join us. If you are interested in finding out how you can help or would like more information in general on how our church is involved in helping fight sex trafficking, we would love to talk with you and pray about your involvement. You're welcome to reach out to me or to Chris Harrison at any time. Thank you and God bless. We are thankful for the ways you've supported Freedom Place and others, and we're thankful for the loyalty you still continue to show to Kingwood United Methodist Church. Uh, you'll notice beside me right now, those ways that you can continue to give to help our ministries thrive, either by mailing in a check to us at the address beside us, through our website, or by texting to give. 
thank you so much for the ways that you continue to help us to be the church.
While there are many challenges for us in this season and time, there are always ways to be creative and press through. We thank God for the gifts of our choir. We know that that night was a very emotional one for them as they, they've not been able to gather and sing, and they were able to, and they have blessed us that way. And we have so many gifts and technology represented in those who help us not only um, in the instruments, but also in technology. Thank you all. So we're launching a new series for the next four weeks entitled, My Hope is Built. In Matthew chapter 7, we find Jesus teaching using a parable about the wise and foolish builders. The foolish builders build their house on sand. The wise builders build their house on a rock. And when the storms come, the ones who had built foolishly upon the sand, everything falls and great was the fall, says the text. But those who built upon the rock, their home and what they built withstood the storms. Jesus makes a direct connection in this passage about hearing the teaching of his word and putting those words into practice as connected to the wise builders, but those who are foolish only hear and do not put into practice what they hear from Jesus. So in the coming weeks, we want to use the scripture to evaluate what we are building our lives upon. Because the reality is the storms in life are inevitable. They're coming. But how you choose to build, that's optional. Where you choose to build, that's optional. So many things today come together the launching of this uh, series. First, we are calling this Christ the King to begin the series. We're going to use a text from John chapter 19. Now, as astute and good United Methodists that are thoroughly immersed within the liturgical calendar, I know that some of you are probably saying, but wait, Pastor, Christ the King isn't until three more weeks away. Christ the King Sunday is traditionally the last Sunday in the liturgical calendar of the year. This year, that is November the 22nd. Because Advent begins on November the 29th, and it begins the church year. And it's a simple example for us of the tension. Do we let the Roman calendar determine everything about life, even though much of it does? Or do we let the calendar and rhythm of the church and the dependency of our lives on Scripture determine our lives? It is, in essence, a living out of what Paul says to be in the world but not of the world. So as we approach this text, we also are celebrating this day, All Saints. And it's important to know this service at 2 o'clock this afternoon will be set up physically exactly as you see it now. Not only will it be live streamed, but it's not just for families. It is a service dedicated for all who would want to come and to celebrate the lives of the faithful. So if you are available, you are welcome to come at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We would love to have you here as we celebrate the saints. But as we begin to read this text, I want you to, to already begin now. I want to challenge you to, to find yourself in the crowd. We're going, to be, we're going to be on the street outside of what's known as the Antonia Fortress. There's going to be a crowd of the religious community. I want you to not just subtly observe with a tone of sort of 20th century arrogance and the distance of time from this event, the actions of those who call for the crucifixion of Christ who is the King. Be careful, friends, as we read this text that you don't say, how could they do such a thing? Because you're living into the very parable and teaching of Jesus about the public and tax collector and the religious leader. And the religious leader comes in and immediately says, Thank you, God, I'm not like all those sinners. But it's the publican who enters with a contrite heart and says, God, I'm not worthy. I'm going to sit at the very back because I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. So when we approach this text... We must be very careful that we do not read ourselves into the place of wanting to stand on the sidelines and tell everybody else, you don't know what you're doing. Don't you know who that is? But my friend, the pilots of this world are giving us a choice even today. Jesus' accusers asked for Barabbas to be released before we get to this text, and Jesus is asked to be crucified. It's literally as if they were living out The text of John chapter 3, verse 19. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So I'm going to ask you this question before we ever get in the text. 
Where are we choosing something other than Christ and his kingship and his kingdom and the ability to let him to be the Lord of our life? Where are we letting anything else other than God determine what reigns supreme and is our highest priority in our life? Now, before we ever get to the text, I also want to set you up and take you to Jerusalem. Where did this encounter take place? Well, first, I want you to notice that in this slide, you're going to see the Antonia Fortress. In the very middle part of the slide is our four columns. This is from the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem, and it is a model of what the Jerusalem would have looked like in the time of Jesus. And the Antonia Fortress are, is right in the very middle. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see the Temple Mount. Now, what's important and why I want to show you this is there is a juxtaposition immediately beside what is represented in the Roman authority and what is represented in the Temple Mount, in the holiest of holies, where the people would come. And I just want to make this point before we ever get there, because geography and architecture can tell us so much. In that picture, you will see the footprint of Rome is small, but the footprint of God is big. But they're side by side. Now, need to understand the political climate in which we're in, Pilate is the one who is to keep the peace with this Jewish group of people. He was sent by Rome. He was based out of Caesarea, Martha Mia, or Caesarea by the sea, but he would go into Jerusalem. And he wanted to make sure he'd keep those Jewish people and those zealots who were religious, those people following Yahweh. Could he keep them in line? Well, not much has changed in 2,000 years. Nothing can keep the people of God in line because we weren't built to be kept in line. We were built for community and to follow Christ. And so the Antonia Fortress is critical for you to understand because there was a small section that was close to the Temple Mount. You know today how we call it a no-man zone or a demilitarized zone? It's sort of the neutral kind of place. Well, if you've got Pilate who represents Rome, who needs to talk to the high priest, and you've got to find that the neutral zone was sort of along the wall in the area outside, and there is an arch that still exists today that shows you where Jesus basically is brought out by Pilate to where the high priest and religious leaders are. It's called the Eke Homo. You see it today. The next slide, please. This is what it looks like today. It still exists. Now, it's, it's been built up around it, but there's a street that goes by. So this arch is known as the Eke Homo, which is the statement of Pilate when he comes out and he says to everybody, Behold the man. Now, before he's named a king by the soldiers, he's named just a man. And so this arch is called the Eke Homo. Behold the man. It's difficult after 2,000 years to know exactly where the location is, but just a little further down this street and below is the best archaeological space that we believe, the stone pavement that you're going to hear. In the Aramaic, it was called the Gabatha, and you're going to hear that in the text in a moment. And this is what the stone pavement looks like. It's a, it's a holy and sacred place, and it's amazing to go into Jerusalem and to read this text and to realize these stones have not changed. They've carried tears and sweat, spills in the very blood and martyr of those in the faith, but this is an area that commemorates where Christ was declared by Pilate to be Christ the King and where he is beginning the journey to the cross. Knowing all of that and hopefully having set in context some of what the area might look like, I want to invite you now to stand as you're able in respect to the gospel, the gospel of John chapter 19. And I want you to listen carefully within this text. I want you to see in this text how the roles are reversed and who are the ones that are proclaiming Jesus is innocent. This guy doesn't need to be crucified. And who are the ones who are saying, crucify him? Listen to how the roles are shifted, because it might surprise you if you haven't lifted carefully before. So then Pilate took Jesus, and he had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up again and again, slapping him in the face, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And once more, Pilate came out 
And he said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to him, Here is the man, Ekehomo. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis of a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought, out Jesus, he brought Jesus out. He sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in the Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as you are, let us pray together. <clears throat> may your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that these words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be transformed into the good news of the gospel of Christ in whose name we've gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will depart and seek to serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say, Amen. What's your highest priority in your life? To whom do you look to determine every decision that you make? This is the essence of what it means to understand who Christ the King is. This is also what it means to say that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of life, but is he the Lord of your life? It's one thing to sing the song, he's got the whole world in his hands, but does he have your world in his hands? This encounter with Jesus is so profound. It would be profound enough to push Pilate to the place to be the one who's trying to defend Jesus and set him free, even amidst the frustration he goes back in. And he wants to tell Jesus he has the power to set him free or the power to crucify him. And Jesus said, you have no power but the power that's been given to you. A familiar phrase Pilate starts with, where are you from? This theme continues throughout all the Gospels because you've heard the Gospel text. You know, they said, oh, he's from Jesus. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He's Mary's son. And they all say, come on, you know it. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? How often do you ask people where they're from? John gives us just in how he captures in the narrative of this encounter these brilliant, mysterious moments that lead us deep into the heart of God. And the tables are flipped. And it's Pilate who's trying to set Jesus free and defend him. And it's the religious leaders who are hell-bent on crucifying and calling for Jesus' death 
even to the point that they would say as religious leaders, we have no king but Caesar. Do you see the irony of the text? That the kind of change in antagonism to powers and personal allegiances that Jesus brings, he can turn Pilate into one who would defend him and be so offensive and threatening that it would make the high priest say, we don't follow anybody but Caesar. What an amazing thing. But in this encounter, it's important to remember the relationship between Pilate and the religious leaders and high priest. You see, before this event with Jesus, the underlying thing that's happening is that in two different encounters, Pilate kind of got things wrong. He came up from Caesarea Martha Mia, where he was the first time years before this, and he tried to impose the images of the religious leader of Rome, which would be Caesar, and the Jewish leaders protested. They actually fasted, they went down, and they convinced Pilate that he shouldn't do it. And Pilate, wanting to establish this relationship early, said, okay, I'll take down the images. A few years later, another leader is here, and Pilate comes in and wants to put another gold, bronze kind of... Um, medallions, if you would, on the walls in that area. And remember that the area of the Antonia Fortress is immediately adjacent to the holiest of holies in the Holy Temple. And the Jewish leaders were so upset, they actually appealed to Rome. And Rome told Pilate, take those down. Don't antagonize the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. You know you get those religious people into a stir and there'll be nothing but problems. So twice... Pilate has had an encounter with the religious leaders, and right now his record is he's down in the count. He's lost twice. This is why the undercurrent is Pilate tries to continue to put back to religious leaders what their choice would be with this person of Jesus. He does it time and again. He's already lost twice. He doesn't want to lose a third time. One of the most fascinating aspects about the Ekahomo that all of this encounter happened in Gabbatha where the stone is, that basically after Jesus is flogged and mocked and, and abused, he comes out to this place, and this begins what's known as the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. The Ekahomo is the first arch. There's a map you can actually get, a colorful map that shows you where to begin. Now the Antonio Fortress I put up here in purple in the top. You see the purple box in that's where the Antonia Fortress was. The red line is the outer wall of the Temple Mount. The holiest of holies is the yellow circle in the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. When you go to the Holy Land and you want to begin the way to the cross, this way of suffering on the Via Dolorosa, you start at the Ec Homo. You start at the place where Pilate says, Behold the man, and he turns Jesus over. But I would suggest to you, that there's another important path. And I've walked this path every time I've been in Jerusalem. But my friends, there is an equally important path, and that is the path and the map into your heart. Because our heart's desire is to rule over ourselves. Our heart's desire is to be in charge of ourselves and our own lives. And we don't want to give control over to anyone else. And when we talk about Christ the King and where your hope is built, it's a simple question Will you relinquish control and decision-making in your life to Christ? Will you let another decide where your priorities need to be, where your resources need to be poured into, in the decisions that you make? And I want to ask you, do you know how to get the map into your heart to let Christ be the Lord of your life? It's really quite simple. I've tried to distill it down. I've wrestled this week, and I've come to the place that I realized there are two words that begin the journey Many things happen on what we call this path of sanctification. In our Wesleyan heritage, John Wesley encouraged us to think about, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, to work out your salvation, that there is a moment of new birth and regeneration that happens when you come to an awareness and surrender your life to Christ. And what Christ has done on, on your behalf on the cross is called the justification of the faith. And while you are justified by fruit, you're, you're justified by faith, You'll always be judged by your fruit. Don't forget that. You've got to put the words that you hear into action. But what that journey looks like 
in learning to be the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of God's kingdom is called sanctification. It's God doing through you in Christ and the Holy Spirit what God has done for you on the cross of Calvary. And to understand what does that map look like, I can't chart it for every one of you. Some of you will take a right-hand turn. Some of you take a left-hand turn. Some of you are going to stay in the spot for quite a while because you're sort of stubborn. But I'm going to encourage you two words. Confession and profession. If we just hang our hat to understand the journey towards allowing Christ to be the King and Lord of our life hangs on these two words, confession and profession. Confession is about admitting what we have done or left undone, but profession is a stated belief toward who we will become. 1 John chapter 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we live in a world where we don't like a lot of confession because we don't like to admit that we are wrong. I've even heard people say, I'm not going to answer that question because this is not a good question. No, it's a very good question. You just don't want to answer it because it's piercing. It really forces you to hold the mirror up. This is why we so strongly encourage participation in small groups, in home groups, in Sunday school classes, so that you can help each other find that place because the reality is there's some parts of your life you don't want to be called up in front of everybody to confess. I'm sure if I said to Matt personally on an individual basis, Matt, what are you struggling with in your faith? He would share one thing. But if I said, Matt, will you please come to the microphone and tell the crowd that will be recorded and seen online, what are you struggling with in your faith? I'm going to get two different answers. There's a sense in which being vulnerable is scary to us. And so we need the smaller communities of faith. We need these micro communities, these partnered relationships, these home groups, these places where we can confess what God is doing in our life. But we can't just stop at confessing what we failed to be or what we have done or left undone. We must then be willing to profess and say, this is who we are. This is who God claims us to be, and this is what we will become. This is why we choose to be the people we are. This is why we choose to stand where we do, whether it be with the girls at Freedom Place or the Oaks of Righteousness or the work that's under society or the encouraging people to share their faith or what happens in the children's ministry or the youth ministry or the prison ministry. We do what we do because this is the profession of our faith that we will put into practice the words of Christ that we will see the face of Christ in the world and we will live in such a way that the face of Christ might be seen in us. You see, confession creates the space in our lives for the Holy Spirit to fill and equip us to profess and proclaim who we believe God has called us to be and who God is calling us to become. And so really nothing's changed in 2,000 years. In this day, I simply... Stand before you and offer the scripture. Imagine that Pilate is here saying, Behold the man, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, whose kingdom shall have no end, whose love is from everlasting to everlasting. Behold this man, the one born of Mary. Behold this one whose love held him to the cross to die for the sins of the world. Behold this man who forgave those who betrayed him, who offered forgiveness for those who crucified him. Behold this man who conquered death so that you and I might always know life. What do you profess? Your profession must always follow your confession. And we begin this journey asking, what does the map to your heart look like? And the one simple question we ask you this week, it's very simple. What does building your hope on God look like this week? What does building your hope on God look like this week? You said it earlier, we say it every week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Behold the man. Who do you say that he is? Let us pray. 
God, we're grateful for the ways in which we are able to experience your grace and your love in ways that surprise us, in ways that we may know are predictable, but we are unprepared for. So would you forgive us as we confess the ways in which we have failed to fully respond for the things that we have left undone, for those things that we fill our hearts and lives up that are empty and shallow. And God, as we confess and make room in our hearts, would you help us to trust and believe and profess who we are and who, are, who we are becoming in Christ as the body that you've called us to be? God, would you remind us this week that we need to be very certain that our allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not to the polls and the election box. Would you remind us that regardless of who is elected, we have chosen already to surrender our lives to Christ, who is the King of this world, the Lord of Lords. God, would you remind us this week that you call us to pray for our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Would you remind us that we're called not to react and lash out, but to turn the other cheek? Would you remind us that we are also called to stand firm in the faith and not negotiate the essentials of the faith, that you are a God who created this world, redeemed us in Christ, and fills us with your Holy Spirit? May we proclaim and stand firm in the faith in ways that point towards the redemptive love of Christ and the building of your kingdom on earth as we know it will become and is in heaven. God, help us to live faithfully from the waters of our baptism and help us be encouraged that as you were with all those who have finished the course of their faith, you are with us now, a God of faithfulness and a God of faith. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people did say, Amen. We'll invite you to stand as you're able in a moment for the closing hymn of faith. My hope is built on nothing less. Go ahead if you'd stand. And I would want to, uh, before we sing the hymn, just remind you, use the gift of technology and reach out to us as a church staff. If you are on the journey of faith, if there's something we can visit with you about, help you be connected, or help you grow in your walk with Christ. But the reality is every one of us is building our life on something. What are you building your life on? And how will you let your hope be built by God in your life this week. Friends, as we think about the faith, it's important to remember that 2,000 years ago, under the supposed power of Caesar, the Son of God was put to death upon a cross. Within a couple of decades later, a man named Nero beheaded Paul in Rome. And 2,000 years later, the church is still proclaiming that Christ has risen from the dead, and people name their children Paul and their dogs and cats Nero and Caesar. Let us not forget. We have read the end of the word 
that God has given to us, and that word is we win no matter how great and deep the struggle. God is with us. So go preach the gospel to everybody that you meet. And as you find it necessary, may God's Spirit help you know when you need to put words to the witness as you go now and be the light of the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. Kingwood United Methodist Church.